I'm Brian V, and this is Why We Work. Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Paul Moore. Paul Moore is the founder and managing partner at Wellings Capital, where they manage recession-resistant commercial and real estate funds. That is way over my head, but I hope he can boil it down to where I can understand it, how they manage storage units, mobile homes, put these assets in people's portfolios so they can earn on their investment. But I also want to know how people get into these markets. But more importantly, I want to know the, what he values in character in work, his own character, the work of his colleagues, and what it takes to be successful in this industry. Join me today with my conversation with Paul Moore. I'm Brian V, and this is Why We Work. Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Paul Moore. Good morning, fine sir. Hey, good morning, Brian. It's great to be here. Thank you very much for joining us. Would you do me a favor? I did a, a brief introduction to you a moment ago, but just tell us where you are, what you're doing in your work at this present moment, and then I'll bring us back. Yeah, I'm in central Virginia. Uh, we moved here. We sold our company about 23 years ago. We moved to the Blue Ridge Mountains to start a nonprofit organization reaching out to international students studying in the U.S. And when that didn't uh, work out so well, I began flipping houses and it got me over 20 years, 21 years to where I am now. Uh, we run Wellings Capital and we invest, my company uh, allows small to mid-sized investors to put money together in a large fund. And then we invest as a large investor in commercial real estate projects. You were a busy man. I looked through your your resume on LinkedIn, and did you, you get exhausted? It, I, I well, I didn't get exhausted. I got encouraged. I mean, looking at the path, and this is just like a superficial view of what you've done, but just on LinkedIn, the path that you took to take you where you are today, it's it's admirable. You did some, like you went from you know, and you can touch on some of the things you've done in a moment here. But just the path you've took, it almost seemed like you planned it. But I'm sure you'll say otherwise. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I absolutely did not plan it. And although I'm grateful for every failure, mistake, pain, and joy, and success along the way, I'm grateful for the impact they had on my life. If I had to start over again at age 21, I would have definitely done some things very, very differently. Mr. Moore, speaking of 21, could you let us know what your very first job was? Even if it was a lemonade stand or diving for golf balls or... Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm searching back through my memory, remembering some um, non-paid things. So I have yeah. to sort those out. Yeah, even so, those as well, yeah. Uh, I mean, just selling, you know, raffle tickets door to door. I'm trying to uh, sort through those. Um, I think my dad and I uh, failed to mention to the grocery store owner that I was only 15 and that I was yeah. starting football practice on August 4th. Um, and so I got a job in a grocery store uh, at age either 14 or 15. And I was only there like for the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I left unexpectedly to go to play, play football. football and go back to school. And so I still feel a little bit bad about that because the guy was you knew me you're... thinking I was going to work all year, you know. That, that kind of happens. There, some people have different plans. What got you out of the door? You mentioned your father and, and you hadn't mentioned that you had football. What got you out of the door to get that job at 14? Um, I just, you know, I, <clears throat> my mom, um, and dad, my dad gave me a great work ethic. My mom was a stay at home mom. She was great, but she gave me this un, um, uh, I honor her, God rest her soul, but she gave me a very unhealthy view of productivity, a very unhealthy view that you're only valued if you're working really, really hard, you've got to keep producing, keep producing. And um, so I think that drivenness 
you know, I think I was sitting around one summer and even though I was working out at the gym three times a week of as every dutiful football, future football star would do, um, I was also wanting to do more. Did you, you mentioned your dad. So was that a good balance between your mom and your dad trying to check the, the produce with, you know, maybe even enjoy mm. enjoying some life or did they compliment each other? And, and sing the same. No, I, I never thought of that before. That's why you're a great interviewer, Brian, because I never would have thought of that question. I'm going to have to take and ponder that later. Uh, my dad gave me character, ethics, kindness, love for people. Uh, my mom was zany and fun, and I have a lot of that as well. I like playing pranks and, and doing capers for people and stuff like that. But um, uh, she she actually gave me this productivity uh, 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 obsession, I'll say. Okay. And so if I came home from school with a report card, and I don't remember that this exact thing happened, but this kind of thing for sure happened, she'd be like, oh, good, good, good. A, 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 A. What? What is this B plus? Let's t- B plus. What? And so I got it in my head, look, if I, don't, if I don't produce really, really well, then I'm not valuable. And um, that obsession has cost me, it's really, it's helped me be really successful, but it's also helped me be really unhealthy as a father, as a CEO. Uh, and, I, and I don't put that on, I don't think I put that on my employees, but I definitely have it on myself. And that you probably don't put it on your employees because you can recognize it's part of you and where you got it from, or at least where it kind of stemmed from. Here, I mentioned to you, I'm in Korea, and and that's a big factor here culturally. You must be the best. And if there's a B, three down from the A, like that's what the focus is on, not on the three A's that came prior. That's so sad. And it's crushing. It's crushing to the soul. It's crushing to you know, your livelihood to think, Hey, look, look what I got. I did this. Look how well I did. Oh, right. Well, you're not the best. And yeah. That's where it will hurt. How, how seriously did you take your football? Because if you're saying your dad helped you with character, team, team sports and, and working together with other people would also be an asset for you in your later careers. Yeah, I, I want to honor my dad here, even though he's been gone for um, 31 years. But um, he he had a very important job at a factory in town. And uh, yet, I didn't even recognize at the time the significance of this. Imagine this. I got out of school at three and we started football practice at 330. He never missed in 12 years of me playing football. Not only did he not miss a game or a scrimmage, he didn't even miss a practice to my memory. He might have got there at 4 or 4.15, but the practice went from 3.30 till, let's say, 5.30. He never missed a practice, and neither did my mom. And um, yet he was raised with a father who was entirely uninterested in his sports, in fact, He went to the state playoff game one or two years in his high school uh, basketball, and his father came to one game ever, and that was because his coworkers shamed him and and took him to the game. Well, yes, that that is very good of your dad. I mean, it's it's heartwarming and heartbreaking, and yeah. it's encouraged. It kind of sets you up, though, for you and your family. It's like, well, this is what your dad did, you know, pass on the baton. It's <laughs> funny. Bet. It's funny because you know, even though I have been really supportive of my kids, I I don't think uh, there's no way I would be able to go to every single practice. I and mean, we're talking, you know, four or five days a week for. Mm-hmm. 12 years, Brian. <laughs> I, I, of course, I know it was only August through yeah, November yeah, 1st, yeah. but that's still yeah. three months. It's a pretty months. solid commitment. Was- yeah, I mean, I'm sure he could have made more money and got more ahead at work if he hadn't left work at 350 every day <laughs> on a nine to five job. How did he do that? That's, I mean, but more fathers should take note of that. However, yeah. they're even like just to flex their schedules a little bit, show up, yeah. even if it's once a week or something. But 
a lot are missing it. And it would be encouraging to hear stories like that and know that, you know, you can make some sacrifices as well. Yeah. Right. Along the way, as you're starting to develop into middle and high school, is your career something in your mind starting to take shape with some of the experiences you had or maybe even further jobs? Um, so I, I got to, as soon as I turned 18, I was eager to work at the factory that he uh, was the um, HR manager at. Uh, it was a factory of, uh, you know, 250, 300 people. And I was eager, but you'll see why in a second. It was 1983, and I was able to make eleven uh, $10.50 an hour way back then. And as a high school, as a senior in high school. So, um, yeah, I did that for two years. And then I worked uh, two years, um, as an engineering intern and made about the same amount of money as that in real exciting oil field jobs. So I uh, got to work on an offshore oil platform dr that had drilled oil and was producing oil in the Gulf of Mexico, South of Louisiana. So that was really fun. That's a good experience. Was your dad going back a bit? Was your dad fair with you as an employee then? Was he, or was he a little harder on you? No, he was never hard on me at all. He, he treated everybody wonderfully. He was the HR director for the entire factory. And so he would have been, he and the president of the company would have been the focal points for all the union's rage. And the union was angry. I mean, they were always angry. I mean, they were always walking around complaining and trying to figure out how to, to get around the rules and complain. But they would say to me, and I, and I mean way more than one person in the factory said, we don't like this company. They're terrible. They've treated us bad. But your dad is a <laughs> wonderful man. And he's the one bright spot in that big, that white, that white stuff shirt office up there. He's the one bright spot. And if he ever says anything, we know he'll keep his word. And we respect him. And that's one of the reasons we like working here still. <laughs> you had some shoes to fill. <laughs> my dad never put that on me for one minute. No, yeah. my, mom, my mom did. She, yeah. I remember things she even said about that, but my dad never did. He was very, very kind. Well, even, yeah, and I guess not even shoes to fill. It's just something to aspire to. Yeah, right. right? That's right. You know, it just, it just it gives you some some tangible thing of something you've experienced that you could be like this and someone close like your father. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So as you looked into college, I know that you got your bachelor and you went in to get mm -hmm. your MBA. How did, how are you starting to think more seriously or more focused on your career? Brian, if I told you the process that I didn't go through to pick a college and to pick my grad school, you would not believe it. You might not even air this podcast. Are you sure you want to hear this? I do. do. So I just figured, okay, so I'm going to go to Ohio State and be a football star. Well, every year of high school, I was about six foot two in like seventh grade, 230 pounds. And then every year I I stopped growing right then in seventh or eighth grade. Mm -hmm. And uh, every year people caught up to me, you know? Mm -hmm. So like by my senior year, I was just a, a, a slightly big kid on a football field. And every year relative to the other players, I got mm -hmm. worse. And so by my senior year, there was no football scholarship <laughs> waiting mm -hmm. for me at all, none at all. And so I started thinking about smaller colleges I could go to to play football. And so I just looked for the one that had the best financial aid package. I actually wanted to be a parapsychologist. Now, for those of you who don't know what that is, that is somebody who studies supernatural phenomena. That would be UFOs, ghosts, ghost busting, uh, the paranormal, uh, haunted not, that's houses. Not, that's not what I thought it was at first. I was like, yeah, so... 
Yeah, no, not two psychologists. And so <laughs> I actually went to my, I actually went to my football coach. I was just telling him about this. I remember where I was standing in the library of my school. That wasn't my senior year to coach, my credit, but it was coach, my, coach, it was my junior. Yeah, exactly. It was my junior year. And he said, so what do you think you want to do with your life? And I said, oh, I'm going to be a parapsychologist. And he said, so like studying paranormal stuff. And I said, yeah, he said, <clears throat> uh, Paul, <laughs> where are you going to get a degree like that? Have you looked into that? And I said, nah, I said, uh, I'm sure there's lots of schools that have that degree. And he said, well, have you found one? And I said, well, I'm sure Duke university because <laughs> Duke University was mentioned in some ghost <laughs> documentary or something. So I actually called, literally called, the, I don't know how I got their number even, but I called the psychology department at Duke University. And I said, can I talk to your parapsychology department? And they said, what? I said, well, you got a degree in parapsychology, right? And they said, no. And they hung up. They thought I was kidding. And so... I realized quite quickly that uh, I had to get another degree. And so literally one day somebody said, hey, you like outdoors, right? You ought to get a degree in geology, study <laughs> rocks. Maybe he really thought I had rocks in my head and he was kidding. So I told everybody I was getting a geology degree. And again, without looking into what it entailed and what those people did, I just decided oh. to do it. And then I kid you not, it was June, my senior year. You know how kids now get set up for college like a year before? I'm talking about two or three months before I went off to college. Two months before. I was at a pool, and I told somebody I was going to study rocks. And they said, well, if you're going to be a geology major, you might as well take a few extra classes and become a petroleum engineer. They can actually get paid better and they drill for oil. And I literally decided on the spot at the pool Great to idea. become a petroleum engineer. And so I told some, then I told the guy, I said, where do I get a degree like that? And he said, well, and he told me one school of the 25 schools in America. He knew of one, and I just decided right then I was going to school there. And this was June. And my dear father, the next week, it could have been the next day for all I know, took off work, and he drove me to that college. We drove to that college. We tracked down the football coach, because that was what was most important, and we tracked him down to make sure he would let me play on his football team. Of course, he said yes, because it was a walk-on school. And uh, so I went to Marietta College and got a petroleum engineering degree and didn't even think about the fact that I should never have been an engineer. I should have been in sales and marketing or something like that. But I didn't think of that till I was like 30. <laughs> it was until the next day. <laughs> That's my sad story. You want to not oh, air this interview no, now? No, no, it, it wasn't sad. It made my head hurt. <laughs> yeah, it makes me laugh too. It makes my head hurt too. <laughs> Mine's a happy hurt. <laughs> you had to pay for it. That's right. That, that, that's great though. <laughs> and then you found out maybe an MBA was, would be good for you. Well, I mean, by my senior year, um, they said, they said uh, if oil prices, oil prices could drop all the way down to $15 a barrel, barrel. and there'd still be jobs in petroleum engineering, and oil pr uh, proceeded to drop to $12 a barrel. And so my, senior, my, my freshman year, there were seven graduates of petroleum engineering on the outbound class, and they had an average of seven job offers each. My senior year, there were 89 graduates and there were seven job offers total. So <laughs> I decided that maybe I should do something different. So thankfully, I had the common sense to get an MBA. To keep going. <laughs> yeah. Advice and put some time on the clock. <laughs> yeah. And if I told you how I chose the school for the <laughs> MBA, you would even be more upset. Oh, you got to keep going. <laughs> well, in summary... I was going to go to University of Texas because they also have petroleum engineering <laughs> masters. What? What was the thinking there? I don't know. And then I decided to go to Vanderbilt because it was only three states away 
like in Tennessee, Ohio <laughs> to Tennessee. And then I made the drive and I was accepted and all set up to go to Vanderbilt. I even had housing. And then I made the drive and I realized what a long drive it was and how long it would be to get home to see my girlfriend in Ohio and literally made that drive, drove home and got all depressed. And I heard from, I don't even want to tell you who, I heard from somebody who went to Ohio State that they had even a better scholarship deal. Now this is again, June and school started in September. <laughs> And I literally called Ohio State. I don't think I even visited the campus, even though it was an hour and a half away. And I, I called him and said, I want to come there. So I could be an hour and a half from my girlfriend. <laughs> it was closer. And my, my friend who went there said, well, Vanderbilt was 49th ranking in Ohio, and Ohio State was 24th. You moved way up. And I said, ranking, what does that mean? <laughs> I literally remember that. Oh, that's great. I mean, but it's, that's how it works too. I, I went to, did my, I went to my university because my friend was going, that was it. There you go. That's a good <laughs> reason. I can go there. I can get a yeah. student loan. All right, let's go. That's a great reason. We did our first semester. We were nicknamed Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell you our GPA, but it's pretty bad. Mr. Moore. <laughs> The, what you're doing now to, to bring you up, you, you mentioned what you're doing. What, what is some, some difficulties and challenges in what you do in your daily work? So um, we carefully vet. There are commercial real estate investing has always been the place of the rich and famous. And um, it has not been a place for the person with 50 or 100,000 uh, US dollars to invest. Mm -hmm. But now it is. I mean, it used to be, you know, you need five or $10 million to get in a good place to invest. But now somebody with 50,000 can invest. So it's exploded uh, in popularity, which means the number of newbies, the new uh, new coming operators has also exploded. We didn't want to be one of those newbies. So we yeah. decided we would just raise money and find the very best operators who had decades of experience to invest with. Because of that, we um, are, uh, we are super choosy about which operators we're going to invest with and we're super picky. And that has been a challenge finding those great operators. So, so I know that you're dealing with what I saw on LinkedIn anyway, is storage units, mobile homes. So the idea, what I, you know, I'm pretty simple and what you do is way over my head, but I would like to understand it. And I'm thinking from buying someone, buying their first home. And I know you have experience with flipping houses. So mm -hmm. what is the progression that maybe you're not, you know, someone who's making mm -hmm. 50 to a hundred to $200,000 a year normally takes getting into this industry? Yeah, so I have some shows on Bigger Pockets, which is the largest real estate investor forum. So I talk to, um, I don't want to exaggerate and say thousands, but for sure, hundreds of real estate investors a year. And the common progression is they've got a W-2 job. It's typically in IT or a doctor or dental or lawyer or something high paid. And they're not necessarily bored but they, they saw a house flipping show and they decided I can do that. So they start buying houses on the side with their spouse often or a friend and they start either flipping the houses and they're often disappointed in how little profit they really make compared to what they expected from the TV show. Or they start building a portfolio of rental homes. And then at some point they realize it's much harder and much more frustrating than they ever thought. But if they're really on top of this, they realize mm -hmm. the tax benefits are pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. And 
I mean, people, you know, in the news right now, we've, we've just had a story that came out three weeks ago about the fact that the president of the United States pays virtually no taxes. And of course, every real estate investor chuckled and said, well, of course he pays virtually no taxes because he's a commercial real estate investor and that's how it is. Mm -hmm. But that's another story. Anyway, so uh, these people scratch their heads and they can, they go, you know, I'm managing, I talked to a guy last night uh, from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He said he had 42 individual houses under management and he realized I really, now 42 is very high for the typical mm -hmm. person doing this on the side. They usually have three to five before they're ready to quit uh, or kill somebody. Anyway, they, um, <laughs> They, they uh, decide to trade all that in and they want to go commercial and they also want to be passive because they realize I'm making 200000 a year in IT. Why am I trying working so hard mm -hmm. to make 30000 a year passively and pulling my hair out on the side gig? And so they want to invest passively and they want to invest in commercial, which would be moving up to say, a hundred unit apartment building. They'd rather be one of 50 investors in a hundred unit apartment than the only owner of five rental homes that are driving them crazy. I was in, in real estate or in property management for a few years, just a couple of years ago. And I, I remember being presented in this class that we were taking the opportunity in these lower income sort of commercial residential buildings. And what I can only think being simple is monopoly. So is the value on these like, you know, the lower income oriental place, Baltic, uh, is it Baltic Avenue that, that mm -hmm. rather than going to boardwalk, is that where you're looking at finding the biggest investment, especially just thinking what little I know of storage and mobile mm -hmm. homes? Self storage is for all kinds of people. The average yeah. income, the average age. Well, I shouldn't say the average. I, I think that would be a mistake. Income. The yep. largest group, mm -hmm. I should say, of self storage renters are between fifty and sixty five. From and again, that's that varies widely. There's yeah. there's college students and there's senior citizens, and everything in between. But mobile home parks are recession okay so those are recession resistant because the cost is so low oh, okay i mean if i'm downsizing in a recession from a four thousand square foot home to a thousand square foot apartment i can keep that self storage unit for only maybe a hundred dollars a month well that's a drop in the bucket compared to my mortgage or my rent of thousands a month and so i probably tend to keep that self storage unit Mobile home parks, the mobile home is the bottom rung on the housing ladder. It's the cheapest form of housing, except living in your parents' or friends' basement, that is. And um, so if you can't afford a mobile home rent, you're probably going to be living under a bridge or back at your parents'. And so it tends to do really well in down economies, but it tends to also do well in good economies. Um, and so there's, there's a real affordable housing crisis in the US. And so the mobile home uh, companies cannot build mobile homes fast enough. Um, and uh, we're, you know, on a teetering, wondering if we're gonna be in a recession while well, people are uh, moving into mobile home parks and there's virtually no vacancies in wherever there's a mobile home. Now there's lots of vacant lots mm -hmm. and that's because uh, it's pretty hard to fill a vacant lot in a mobile home park. A really good operator can do that all day long. A really mediocre or poor or one-off mom and pop operator has a very hard time filling vacancies. So at any rate, all that is to say mobile home parks are a great recession resistant investment. That's not recession proof, but it's, mm -hmm. it does well in recessions at least. Mr. Moore, back to you as a worker and managing this, these funds, what is it people that you would like that people could understand more about you and the work that you do in trying to help them with their investments or um, to help them in their life? We've been really agonizing over uh, some operators. We have only chosen, so between our goal was to find five or 10 good operators to spread the money around. 
And in the last seven, 17 of the last 18 months, we have only had one new operator join our investment pool. Mm -hmm. And it's not to say we didn't try. We searched far and wide throughout America looking for the next operators to add. And we're, again, we were hoping to get to five to 10. And we just added two more after many, many months of talking to them and interviewing them. And uh, so after adding these two more now, we have three operators in our current main fund. We have other funds that are smaller. But um, our main challenge is finding those operators because we don't want to be apologizing and losing sleep for the next nine and a half years of our 10-year fund because we made a one mistake with an operator. And in fact, my business partner and I, who often disagree on things, and that's what makes our partnership so healthy. Mm -hmm. We often disagree on things. And um, we, uh, we were disagreeing late into the, uh, into the evening last night about the certain aspect of the next operator that we might bring on. I know you're pressed for time and I have several questions, but I'd, so if, if I seem a little boggled, it's because I'm trying to go through them while at the same time getting the best out of you. All right. How do you stay productive in your work? Just the things that you do and knowing some of the path that has taken you where you are and being busy, especially staying up late and hashing it out with your coworkers. How do you stay productive and, and staying up with the trends and doing all that you do? How do I stay productive? That's been one of the biggest challenges for me. And it just occurred to me as you asked that, that my obsession with productivity has actually caused me to be unproductive. And I never thought of that sentence before. I spent a three-day retreat last weekend and a lot of the focus of the retreat, not all of it, was on productivity. And I, I, um, my obsession with productivity has actually caused me to be far less productive. And I could explain if you'd like. Um, sure. My dad taught me this work ethic. My mom and dad both did. But my dad taught me this work ethic and part of it was character based. And he said, if you ever give your word ever, and even if you imply and people expect you to do something, you make sure son, you do it. And I, I lived in a factory, I mean, for two summer jobs where people were saying, your dad always kept his word and that's why we love him. So I got it in my head, always keep your word, even if it's implied. <clears throat> I also had a mom who said, you don't produce, then you don't have value. And she never said that, of course. It just was implied in the way we interacted. Mm -hmm. And um, so, um, I, so I, I took it upon myself to answer every voicemail, every email. I mean, I literally, as I'm sitting here, if I let myself, my mind could drift mm -hmm. wondering what emails came in since... I quit working last night at 10 o'clock. What emails came in between 10 p.m. and almost 9 a.m. that I need to rush to answer? That's not true. That's a lie. People are not sitting by their computer wondering why Paul hasn't answered them yet, even though it's only been a night. But I think it's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I've got to get back to them or I'm going to disappoint them. I can't disappoint them because my dad and mom always said, don't disappoint anybody. And so by this obsession with keeping my promise to these strangers I've never met, replying to their emails, therefore I have not done what I needed to do. And that's be really productive by writing an article. I need to write an article for the blog I work for today and have it out by 5 p.m. Well, I haven't got it done because I've been answering emails. And that was a little revelation just now. And again, you are a great interviewer because you caused me to think of things by being obsessed with productivity. I am not productive. Hmm. Thinking of my audience and thinking of, you know, this revelation you're having of how they can be better equipped in their work. So just a, 
a tip for people getting into work, thinking of yourself working at the grocer when you're 14 or working in their father's factory or doing some other jobs or changing careers as you see that, you know, not all jobs are recession proof. So do you have a tip for people who are getting into work wherever they are in their life? Yeah, my tip would just be go spend $15 and buy Gary Keller's and Jay Papazan's book called The One Thing. The One Thing teaches people to be really focused. And if you choose well at a young age, let's say you're 21 right now, and you choose what you'll actually do for the rest of your life, be obsessively focused on that one thing. There's a Chinese proverb that says, he who chases two rabbits catches neither. And the worst times of my life, I can remember this really clearly, the worst times of my work life have been when I tried to, I was on a good path, I was growing, I was making money, I got a little bored, and I decided to, instead of being willing to tolerate the monotony of success, I chose chasing shiny objects. And instead of tolerating the monotony of success, which famous people like Warren Buffett and Bill Gates and all these people, they stayed obsessively focused even when it got monotonous. Warren Buffett's life has been incredibly monotonous. Mm -hmm. And yet he's been incredibly successful because he stayed on that path. Something about him was willing to work you know, to you know, every, anybody who knows Buffett knows what he does every day. It's incredibly monotonous. And uh, yet he's done that. I chased shiny objects. The year was 1997. We were getting ready to sell our company. And I could cry on air right now if I let myself. We had seven months to build our company as far as we could. And I got diverted. I never shared this with my business partner to this day. I got diverted by a multi-level marketing scheme on the side and chased that. Every, all my passion and desire were to build that. So when we sold our company October, that, we, that I'd have something else to do rather than build the company that would have, we could have made an extra million dollars in that six months and instead, I chased a shiny object I never made one thin dime from. Don't do that. People stay focused on what you're really good at and then let those, shi let those shiny objects go. In what you say, you're answering a lot of my questions. And this is a new question I'm trying to work out is, do you define your role or how do you define your role? Is it in your work? or who you are when you work. Mm. Um, I think you're talking about that with people who, you know, become these things, but I mean, mentioning your father a few times, that seems no. to be a driving force too. It's definitely who I am uh, because I'm thinking back even to the conflict I had, the friendly conflict I had with my business partner last night. Yesterday, yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, no, it's, I, I, I don't know. I'd have to think about that some more. That's another great question I've never thought of. Um, and I'd have to think about it, but like yesterday, um, I had to skip a lunch meeting with an investor who drove two and a half hours to meet me an hour and an hour into his drive. I had to call him and tell him, that somebody had been at our house two days before who just got COVID diagnosis. And as, a, as such, I said, ethically and morally, mm -hmm. I think it would be right. I just found this out that I miss that I not have lunch with you, but you're already set up to have lunch with my business partner. Anyway, I wanted to call to personally uh, tell you how sorry I was. And I, at that moment, I was really tempted to say, I just found out. And those words mm -hmm. did come out of my mouth. I just found out. But then the ding, 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 ding went in the back of my head and said, that's not true. You found out two and a half hours ago and you could have called him before he left home. And so I 
recalibrate. Of course, these thoughts, you know, yeah. you can think, uh, what is it, 40 quadrillion thoughts a second? Literally, your brain can do that. And so all that happened in less than a second, I'm sure. And I said, well, when I say just found out, I actually could have called you this morning. I found out at 9 a.m. And now it was 11, I think. And I said, I really should have called you then, but I didn't even think anything about it. I thought, well, I'm not, ex I don't have any symptoms. I was going to meet you. And then I thought better of it. So in other words, I went ahead and explained the truth. And so I think like my dad and I think my mom too, I wanted to be, I wanted to have character over yeah. looking good. I mean, Hey, I got a podcast called how to lose money. After all, I'm willing to look bad on air. Mr. Mort, I wish I had more time with you. I know you have another. Hey, meeting. I'm good. I'm good for 10 minutes. You're good. Well, in, in saying who you are is what defines your, your life. What is a character trait that you're working on that you're trying to just, I mean, you're talking about honesty. You've mm -hmm. you talked about integrity. What is something that might be lacking that just is something that's been a challenge for a number of years that you're you're hoping to fine tune a little bit well this wouldn't be what maybe you would expect but based on what i said earlier i need to learn to say no because saying yes to everybody all the time means saying no to my family yeah and saying no to my friends and saying no to big things I've told myself and my family that I need and want to do. And it means it can be very, very devastating because I see my work, uh, although I, I really want to, to serve these hundreds of investors, I also see it as a means to raise money to fight human trafficking and do big things in the world and not work as an end in itself. And as a result, I'm not doing some of those things because I'm saying yes to every, historically, to every random request. Well, that leads to my next question of how are you making work-life choices or keeping them in check? How are you separating your work or are you still working on it? Right, like I'm really working on it. My business partner has actually been very hard on me and like, so he will almost every, not quite every day, but he'll almost every day, literally, I've given him a, my access to my emails and of course my calendar. And he'll say, what's this, uh, what's this noon meeting? Oh, I'm just helping a guy out. It's nothing. <laughs> He's like, yeah, but that's another half an hour. You couldn't work on your article that you said you had to be done at 5 p.m. today. <laughs> but yet at 5 p.m. last week, you said you hadn't even started oh, it. That is tough. You're doing it again. And it's really frustrating. And Brian, what's even more frustrating is that I'm 56 and my business partner's 27, less than half my age. And so yet, Yet I was, and this is where I'm going to pat myself on the back a little. I actually have given him access to my email account yeah. so he can see what I'm doing, who I'm replying to. And he'll say, couldn't Emerson have done this? Mm -hmm. Your assistant. Yeah. So yeah, that's what I'm doing to work on this. <laughs> you mentioned education and how you kind of fell into the things that you've done. How, how much do you value education or in the planning of it for the listeners? Because there seems to be a push that it's not necessary, but I take the idea that formal education is, is beneficial, um, but there's also hands-on experience and things that you, know, you and I are learning all along the way. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm on the fence on this. Mm -hmm. um, my son's a better example than me. So my son, after years of struggling, not that many years, but it felt like it to him because he was doing landscaping and menial, what he considered menial work. It was menial for him because he wasn't cut out for that exact job, I guess. Mm -hmm. But he was doing this really hard work. He was miserable. And he, for time's sake, I won't get into what it was, but he found a certain type of real estate investing he wanted to do. He went and first... Um, mentored under somebody for a number of years. After mentoring under them, that person convinced him that he should 
go um, go to college in that. And instead of doing a four year, $200,000 college, he said, I'll give you a hint. You can do just as well in this career with a two year degree from this certain community college mm -hmm. uh, that is only going to cost, it turned out, $13,000 for two years of school. 13,000 total. Yeah. I think it turned out to be 11, in fact. And um, so he got that degree and he'd already been mentoring in this exact field for a couple of years and it was a perfect combination. And so I think that would be, though not for everybody, I mean, IT people and mm -hmm. medical doctors mm -hmm. and dentists, they need lots and lots more school than that. Mm -hmm. But some people don't need don't. school at yeah. all. Yep. Yeah. I agree. And thinking more of the, the listeners, who may be discouraged and not knowing maybe like your son who were in a job that they shouldn't be in, or they just didn't find their niche yet. What type of encouragement do you give them in finding their job and finding their work? Mm, you know, there's two schools of thought on this and both uh, they're completely contrary. So I'll give you both. One is the Jewish school of thought. And I heard a Jewish rabbi very powerfully, make this point. He said, don't find what makes you come alive. That's odd. Go out and find what the world needs. Mm -hmm. Fill that spot. Make a lot of, I mean, do a lot of good for them. You'll make a lot of money, but you'll find out that that makes you come alive. Mm -hmm. Huh? Really? Yeah, I haven't yeah. heard that yet in my episodes. Yeah. Um, I'm looking for his name, Dr. Uh, Rabbi, excuse me, Rabbi Daniel Lappin. I'm looking at his book on my shelf, Thou Shalt Prosper. Okay, Rabbi Daniel Lappin says that. And then the other school of thought, mm -hmm. which people like, uh, I believe it was um, John Eldridge in Wild at Heart, the great book Wild at Heart, said, find, don't, don't go figuring out what the world needs, but find out what makes you come alive. The world really needs men and women who are, who are alive. alive yeah and that made total sense to me mm -hmm. well but what about that girl <laughs> i know who decided in high school foolishly that she should spend hundreds goes a hundred thousand dollars in debt to get a french degree because it made her feel good to speak french mm -hmm. she has a hundred thousand almost a hundred thousand in debt now she now works for $10 an hour, last I checked, and she doesn't have any way of paying off this debt, and she's kicking herself 12 years later going, what did an 18-year-old know about what made me come alive? Mm -hmm. That's powerful, my friends, yeah. and that is something to consider. Brian, I know we're out of time. Yes, if sir. you would like to pause this recording and jump back on tonight, when you wake up tomorrow morning, I would love to do it. I, I would like to even get in touch with you again some other time. If you would just either one, tell where people can find you and ask my answer my final question of why do you work? Well, I got to jump on this other call in a minute, but um, wellingscapital.com is where they can get a hold of me. It's W-E-L-L-I-N-G-S, C-A-P-I-T-A-L, wellingscapital.com. We've got a wonderful gift there for listeners. And you can actually, if you have any interest in learning why the wealthiest people in the world invest in commercial real estate, you can find out there because we have a five part free e-course on investing in commercial real estate. Wellingscapital.com uh, is that location. Um, so I work for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons is this, if you look uh, at the stats of about human trafficking, which I had not heard until fairly recently, about four or five years ago, I found out that if you took the record profits, the record profits of Apple, GM, Nike, and Starbucks, add those record profits together, double that number, that's the estimated revenues generated by human trafficking throughout the world. And it's not just in the Philippines. It's not just in a country far away. It's actually happening in your town and my town. 
and they just busted a whole lot of people in my home state of my former home state of Ohio for doing this just this week. And so if I'd like to believe if I was alive in the 1800s, I would have been an abolitionist, abolitionist fighting slave against slavery. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to believe that if I was an adult in the 1960s in America, I would have been fighting for civil rights. Well, this yeah. is a civil right. It is slavery, and it's been ripped away from thousands of people who are um, uh, all over the world. And as a result, it's been, um, their life has been literally ripped away. And I'd like to fight human trafficking. And so one of my goals is to let the world know that human trafficking is a great evil. And my desire would be to use my work as a platform for that, but also use the funds I generate at work to fight human trafficking and rescue its victims. And I would recommend that you and your listeners on this podcast do the same. Paul Moore, founder, managing partner at Wellings Capital. Thank you, kind sir. Thank you. I just told my uh, listen, my my my, my my friend here that I'd be late for the call here, but I'm really, really glad to be on your show today. I'd love to come back and talk more. It's been great, Brian. You've got me thinking a lot. Great show. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Right. Take care.